community with children that had normal eyes. Kelly was on many times bullied and that affected his schooling. His parents were Christian believers and they sought a Catholic orphanage which was accommodating impaired children like Kelly to enable them to have basic and elementary education. Learning at a Catholic institute molded Kelly to be a Roman Catholic and he wanted so badly to be a priest. When he was of age, Kelly, with the blessing of his parents, was enrolled into a seminary. Though he had just one eye, Kelly was able to read and see. While he was at the seminary uh, in Tanzania, he was privileged to read many books covering the history of kings of the world, the Roman Catholic Church, and other interesting subjects. One day, Kelly was researching the case of Martin Luther. He was stunned by the courage he had to stand up for something he knew to be true. After his training, Kelly was ordained as a priest in the presence of his parents, friends, and relatives. But inside of his heart, he had a big question about the sins of Rome. He prayed to God to open his blind eye to see God's truth. He became very uncomfortable with the many crimes the papacy had committed in the long past, but remained silent. When the bishop visited the parish where Kelly was now working, the bishop received a very good report about Kelly which impressed him and he was recommended to run a small church of Catholic believers in the eastern part of Tanzania. He accepted the promotion and left for his assigned duty as a new priest for this upcoming church. While there, Kelly's desire to break his silence began. In his research, Kelly discovered that the Seventh-day Sabbath had been changed to Sunday. He later discovered about the Dark Ages and other dark evils committed by Rome. He told all his members that he felt he was in the wrong church. He later even told his people about Martin Luther. He was the first priest to allow a Bible study after conducting a Mass. This was his own creation as he wanted to speak and to reveal more of the secrets of Rome. Um, PB, now that's what the gentleman who writes this letter, he calls me PB. It doesn't mean peanut butter, it means Pastor Bill. Um, he said, PB, God is good. God allowed one of our contacts to go to the village where Kelly was uh, a priest. And he was at the market to buy some vegetables when he saw a young man handing out free literature. Since Kelly loves researching, Kelly got the book, The Secret Terrorist, The Enemy Unmasked, and some tracts and DVDs. Kelly was shocked to find out truth he had never learned before. He learned about the true Sabbath and other wonderful lessons. He read the books in 10 days. He called our contact for more books. But this time around, our contact brought him many DVDs uh, over the books of Daniel and Revelation and the amazing grace of God. After reading the books and watching the DVDs, Kelly burned his priestly robes. Wow. He called the bishop and said that he is no longer going to be a Catholic priest. He was called to speak before a large meeting where other priests and bishops had convened. Kelly fearlessly prayed to God for wisdom to guide his tongue. And in the meantime, most of his church members had come to be on his side. Kelly arrived when the heads of the Catholic leadership were seated and many of the bishops looked down upon him. 
The lead bishop asked Kelly to explain his reasons why he had left the priesthood and deceived so many of his church members. Kelly was happy to be given the opportunity. He was not wearing a priestly robe. He was wearing casual clothes. He stood up and looked at the several bishops who had angry faces. He told them that he was standing before them in the spirit and power of Martin Luther with a question he would need an answer. The bishops were surprised and opened their eyes to look and to listen to a one-eyed man. Kelly asked them to tell him whether the papacy is right to alter God's laws. And he wanted the meeting to tell him whether they have read the writings of Martin Luther and Malachi Martin. Those questions brought commotion among the bishops for many of them had never read books that Kelly had read. The lead bishop rose up in anger, shouted at Kelly, but Kelly stood firm and told the panel of bishops that they with both eyes have failed to see clearly the many sins of the Roman system that is cheating and misleading masses of people to think there is salvation in empty circles of false worship. Wow. He told them that with a single eye, he was able to see what they with both eyes had failed to see. He shamed Rome by lifting up the two books, The Secret Terrorist and The Enemy Unmasked. To most of the bishops and priests present, it was the first time to ever see those books. He pointed to them, kissed them, saying, God bless them for opening my eyes. This so angered the lead bishop who began to curse him. But some wanted to hear more from Kelly, and there was a commotion. Kelly continued to speak until he was sent out, leaving the two books which were being examined by many of the bishops. The books caused other bishops to go to the YouTube channel of Truth Triumphant and began to learn the truth privately. Kelly was barred to do all his studies in that small church, but the people found a school where they have continued to worship every Sabbath in peace. This is the story of a one-eyed man whom God used to catch some good fish into a net. This group has continued to study and from the books and DVDs that we have sent them, and they are very, very happy. God has continued to bless in the spreading of materials that you continue to help us with here in Africa. I'm thrilled to share with you about a one-eyed man and how God is truly leading his people out of Babylon by very simple and humble means. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> yes, he had, Linda. Yes, he had. He'd read Malachi Martin. He'd read about Luther. And uh, God is amazing how God can reach people uh, right in the very heart of Babylon and uh, bring them to the truth. So pray, praise God. Praise God. You know, folk, 30 odd, no, not 30, be uh, closer to 47 odd years ago when I was introduced to the message of Seventh-day Adventists, when I was introduced to Jesus. Um, that was my one, one desire, was to share the truth of God to all the world. Um, you know, and then, then to be able to learn about the three angels' messages, the everlasting gospel, uh, fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And then the second and third angels' messages, 
and to see the beauty of scripture and the beauty of truth and to have the opportunity to share that all over the world. That was my only goal. And I'm thankful that 47 years later, uh, I'm having the privilege to do just that. Um, I'm, I'm just very, very thankful. And I think, friends, that that's what, you know, you and I have been called to do. It's, it's to share these messages all over this planet. And uh, as, as God opens doors for us to do that, uh, to walk through those doors and to share not just one message, but all three of them, uh, the everlasting gospel. So uh, I'm just grateful that I've had that privilege and I still have that privilege today. And uh, we're just going to keep going through doors as, as the Lord opens them. Uh, this morning, um, you know, after last night's meeting on when Jesus broke the fifth commandment, I, I really hesitated to have another meeting uh, like the one we're going to look at. Uh, I, as I've shared with people in different parts of the country uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, I really don't enjoy uh, giving meetings like this. I really don't. Um, Actually, I wish this gentleman, uh, Gwenun Diop, I, I just wish he would be quiet. I really do. I wish he would just, you know, just cease and desist. Because every time he opens his mouth, he gets into more and more trouble. And uh, to share it, I think it's instructive because I, I think it will help us to understand where we are as a people, uh, how close we are to the coming of Christ, how close we are to the latter reign of Revelation chapter 18, uh, and how far along we are in the, um, the shaking in Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, we're a long ways, folk, and we're coming to the end of the shaking. We're coming to the end. So we're going to look at this this morning. Diop treads dangerously. During the church service, we're going to look at the everlasting covenant, which um, that's something I, I love to talk about. Uh, the covenant that God has made with humanity from the beginning of earth's history, it's the same covenant he wants to make with each of us today. So we're going to look at that through the writings of the Apostle Paul during the church service. Uh, after lunch then, we're going to have a question and answer period, and we will have the mics going around, and uh, folk will be able to ask any question about any subject uh, that you would like. So that's what we're looking at for this morning. So Diop treads dangerously. You know, tightrope walkers walking across the Niagara Falls, that's not something I really want to be doing, folk. Um, I would find that absolutely terrifying to walk across a tightrope over the Niagara Falls. But Gwenun Diop is doing that very thing. Gwenun Diop just doesn't quit. He's determined to destroy Seventh-day Adventism. Within the last seven months, he has made statements that if taken seriously, one would cease to be a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. Now that's scary, folks. That's scary because Benun Diop has tremendous power as the head of the Public Affairs and Re Religious Liberty Department of Seventh-day Adventists. We're going to look at the statements that he's made in the last seven months. Uh, in between those two statements, one in April and then one just about uh, two weeks ago, 
Gwenun Diop had a stroke. Uh, it looked like he was going to die. Um, I firmly believe that God allowed that stroke to take place to appeal to this man to repent of his wrongdoings. But clearly, Gwenun Diop is not listening. Ominous forebodings lay ahead in this man's future. He's walking a tightrope, and he is in serious, serious trouble. Now, back in the spring of this year, about seven, six, seven months ago, Gwenun Diop made the following shocking statement in the midst of all the leadership of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He said this, he said, the fruit of the Holy Spirit excludes violence against others. If we go after people's faith, it is irresponsible. Why? Because we put, in fact, Seventh-day Adventist lives in danger, and that would be reckless. We have to remember we are a restorationist movement, not a sectarian, violent breed of believers, closet terrorists, in fact. Now, I underline this part. I want us to think about some of these things. He said, if we go after someone else's faith, we become irresponsible. Not only are we irresponsible, we're reckless and we're a closet terrorist. Now, folk, I want you to think for a minute. Have we been given any messages as Seventh-day Adventists that discuss other religious beliefs? Now think about that. Are there any messages you know about that talk about other religious groups? Have we been called to give messages like that? Calling people out of Babylon? Revelation 18.4. So according to this man, if we preach the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Or if we preach the third angel's message, if any man worship the beast in his image, or we preach Revelation chapter 18, the final warning message to this planet to come out of her, my people, because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. According to Gwenun Diop, if we give those messages, we are irresponsible, we are reckless, and we are terrorists. Now, folk, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, looking at that statement by Gwenun Diop, I'd say, you're joking. That's ridiculous. That's dumb. Because the messages we have been given as a people the second and third angel's message, the loud cry of Revelation chapter 18, they definitely discuss other people's faith. They discuss about apostate Protestantism. They discuss about Roman Catholicism. Now think about for one moment, if you would, do you know a book written by Ellen White, where she talks about apostate Protestant churches? The Great Controversy. So based on what Gwenun Diop has said, the Great Controversy, Ellen White, 
and the Holy Spirit that inspired her are irresponsible. They're reckless. And in fact, Ellen White and the great controversy are terrorists. You've got to be, is this guy serious? Think about that. Is this guy really serious? He is. He's serious. And at that meeting of general conference leaders, back in the spring of last year, and it's right on the computer, you can go back and type in some of this, and you can listen to, to Gwenun Diop declare these things. All the general conference leaders sat there and said, Amen. Let it go, Gwenun. This is great. Folks, oh, that's ludicrous. That's nonsense. That's insanity, and it's satanic. So we can't speak against other faiths or other churches? When we do, well, what happens? We've done a, a lot of missionary work in, in various parts of the world. And we found, well, as you noticed in the letter I shared with you a few moments ago, Kelly, the one-eyed bishop, he loved the truth. He embraced the truth as it was in Jesus. But did everybody embrace it? No, some people got very, very angry. Does that mean the message is wrong? Of course not. The message isn't bad, but the people rise up against it because their rebellious heart says no to God. Well, think about it. When somebody gives the straight truth of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, some people respond violently. Whose fault is that? Is it the listener's fault or is it the person who gave the message? Whose fault is it? It's the fault of the listener who refuses to submit to God's messages. Since people respond violently, we're not to proclaim those messages. That's what Gwenun Diop is telling us. Now, can we think of any messages we've been given that speak against other faiths? Well, of course. Some people respond to them violently. Are we therefore not to give them? Of course not. We're supposed to give those messages to the ends of the earth. We're to share those truths. Absolutely. There you go. Islam respond, many Islamic peoples will respond violently to the message of Christ and the truth. Does that mean that we're not supposed to give those messages? Of course not. According to Gwenun Diop, we're not to give those messages of the second and third angel's message. They create violence. They make people get violent. And Diop declared for us that since those messages create violence, they cannot be of the Holy Spirit. Go back here, friends. He says the fruit of the Holy Spirit excludes violence against others. Well, if people become violent when the three angels' messages are presented, then those messages must not be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Really? Well, what messages is Benun Diop referencing? Well, here we have it. Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. And in the second and third angel's message, 
The Bible says there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Well, in the context of Revelation 14, who is Babylon fallen? Who is that? Somebody help me now. I cleaned my ears this morning, but I'm not hearing any answers. Come on. Who is it? In the context of the second angel's message that was first given in 1844, Babylon fallen. Rome had been fallen for centuries. So who is Babylon fallen in the second angel's message? Apostate Protestantism. Is that somebody else's faith? Yes, it is. And Gwenun Diop said, do not give that message. If you do, you're a terrorist. If you do, you're reckless. And you're irresponsible. So the question, folk, that Seventh-day Adventists have got to ask themselves, here is a leader in the denomination. He's telling us, and of course, Gwenun Diop as a leader in the church and the church is going through, therefore Gwenun Diop must be a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. Do we follow him? Do we follow what Diop is saying, folks? If we do, then we have to disobey God. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now here in the third angel's message, if any man honor the Sunday tradition of the beast and his image, well, who is the beast of Revelation 14 and verse 9? Who is that? The papacy. This is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 that rules for 1260 years, that destroys the Ten Commandments, that persecutes the people of God, that claims to be God on earth. Not a welcomed message in our world today, is it? It's not a welcomed message. It's not a politically correct message. But does it have to be given anyway? Absolutely it does, folk. Absolutely. We've been called to give these messages. Some people reject them. Some people get angry when those messages are given. So do we stop giving them then? Not at all. According to Gwenun Diop, if we give these messages, we are reckless irresponsible and closet terrorists and the general conference brethren that were at that meeting listening to him say those things said amen do you remember what Ellen White said a long time ago who did she say would finish the work of God at the end of time. Who did she say would finish the work? The laity would finish the work. Why? Why wouldn't the, the high ranking officials? It's because they've turned away from those messages. So God would raise up the laity to carry forth those messages throughout the world. Now hold your question. We'll get it in the Q&A this afternoon. Gwenun Diop says that the Holy Spirit does not create violence. Since the second and third angel's messages sometimes get a violent response from those that oppose them, 
Diop's conclusion is, therefore, the three angels' messages are not of the Holy Spirit. Folk, who inspired the three angels' messages? The Holy Spirit did. But now Gwenun Diop is telling us that because people respond violently to them, those messages are not of the Holy Spirit. That's scary, folks. That man's committing the unpardonable sin, calling right wrong and wrong right. He's attributing the work of God, which is the proclaiming of the three angels' messages, as not of the Holy Spirit, because people get violent when they oppose these truths. The unpardonable sin is calling the work of God of the devil, and the work of the devil as from God. Now, can you think of anybody in the history of our world that has given a message that was responded to violently? Can you think of anybody in Scripture who gave a message? Jesus. All the prophets. Do you see, folk? This is completely flipping the Bible upside down. How about the first two boys on this earth? Do you remember their names? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Abel told Cain. How did Cain respond to what Abel said? He got violent, didn't he? Whose fault was that? Was it Abel's fault or was it Cain's fault? That's exactly right. According to Gwenun Diop, it was Abel's fault. Folk, this man has completely flipped the Bible upside down. Completely flipped it upside down. What about Abel? What about John the Baptist? Did Herod and Herodias like what John had to say about their relationship? Of course not. They responded violently to him, didn't they? They had him killed. According to Gwenun Diop, whose fault was it? It was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist's fault. Jesus himself, when he spoke, people got mad and they ended up killing him. According to Gwenun Diop, Whose fault was it? Jesus. It was Jesus' fault. Folk, this is flipping the Bible upside down. All men of God that spoke heaven's truth for their time were not accepted. In fact, by the rejection of their messages, people got very angry. Does that make their messages not of the Holy Spirit? Folk, that, that's insane. That's insane. In Diop's mind, these men were in the wrong. Abel, John the Baptist, Jesus, Elijah, Jeremiah, all the men of God in times past. In Gwenun Diop's mind, these men were all in the wrong. They were terrorists and should have stopped their preaching. Now, I was in Santa Clara, California about a month ago having meetings out there. And there was a couple from Kenya that were there. They now live in the Bay Area. And uh, they said, I'm, we're going to be seeing Ted Wilson soon. Do you have any questions you'd like for us to ask him? I said, yes. Uh, ask him why he was confused on the Mark of the Beast for seven years. I said, ask him why he continues to support Gwenun Diop going all over the world in the name of Adventist ecumenism, as well as himself, Jim. And I asked a few other things uh, about the jab, about COVID, et cetera, et cetera. 
When they, and they asked him all these questions. When he came to Gwenun Diop, Ted Wilson said, Gwenun Diop is a man of God. Yeah. Folk? Yeah. yeah, which God? That's exactly right. Folk, in Seventh-day Adventism today, the script is being flipped so that people like Ted Wilson, Mark Finley, Ivor Myers, Gwenun Diop, uh, Stephen Bohr, these men are flipping the script, folks, and that's what we're dealing with. It's what we're dealing with. This is, this, this is, this is so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. But this is what's going on. I wrote to Doug Batchelor at Amazing Facts. I stopped doing that. It doesn't get very far. But I wrote to Doug Batchelor about these things that Gwenun Diop was saying. This was the response I got this time. Doug Batchelor wrote back. It's very true that the conditions in some parts of the Seventh-day Adventist work are deplorable. It's a great, it's a great challenge to through stay to God's, true principles. God's principles at a time when apostasy and spiritual decline are very widespread, not just in our church, but throughout the world. We're living in the time of the Elijah message. We can expect that conditions will be very similar to what he faced. At the same time, I do not feel that it is appropriate for me to comment on particular individuals or pastors. Now, this is why he said he wouldn't. Doing so would provide grounds for being highly misunderstood and would prove detrimental to our ministry. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? It's about money. Folk, you know what? We didn't look at it last night, but it's appropriate. In Ezekiel chapter 33, it talks about the role that God's ministers are to carry out. And do you know what God's ministers are called? What are they called? Watchmen. Watchmen on the walls. What did a watchman do? What was the point of the watchman? To look out over the valley, and if they saw an enemy coming, they were to blow the trumpet and say, watch out, this is what's happening, the enemy's coming. That's right, Isaiah 58, to cry aloud and spare not. That's what God's ministers are to do. And what are, what are we hearing here? I can't do that because I might be misunderstood and it might cut back on some of the money that comes into the ministry. Folks, this... All prophets were to stand up and tell. Even here, Doug Batchelor mentions the Elijah message. What did Elijah do? Did he look at Ahab and pat him on the back and say, Ahab, you just keep staying married to that Jezebel and keep promoting the Baal prophets? Folk, this is ludicrous. This is ludicrous. Now, this might surprise you. You might say, Bill, now, now I understand why you get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> well, folk, I'm going to put the icing on the cake now. See, what, how do we respond to this? Do we just, you know, uh, you know, giggle and say, boy, how could Doug do that? And then when we pull out our checkbook, uh, Let's see, pay to the order of amazing facts. Folk, how, 
how can you support that? How? You know, uh, I was at a, a, a meeting about a year ago. It was up over in Alabama with Jeremy and, and Megan. Had a great time. But I can still remember during the Q&A, um, there were about six, six men up there at the platform and the people were asking us questions. And they were about various things that were going on in the church. That's what people are interested in. They want to know what's going on. And for all the questions, it was about, you know, what about this? This is going on in the denomination. Well, finally, somebody raised their hand and said, how do we respond to it? What should we do? Well, the various ministers that were up on the platform, they got a little bit squeamish. And I said, let me have the mic. And I said, you know what you do? You speak with your pocketbook. Amen. That's what you do. Because as the dear brother said to me last night, the one passage in Seventh-day Adventism that the denomination knows is what verse? Malachi, 2, verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse. That's all they care about, folk. So if you want to bring about change, you do it with your pocketbook. You go to your pastor and you say, you know, in all respect, pastor, I mean, you know, folk, uh, as we learned last night, in, in truth, a pastor, the, the position deserves respect. So you go to your pastor and you say, you know, pastor, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I want to hear the three angels' messages. And I don't hear them in our church. So until I do, I'm not going to put another dime in the till. I'm not going to. And you put your tithe or your offerings wherever you want to, where the work of God is being done. Amen. But folk do not support apostasy. This is apostasy. This is a man saying, I see the problems in the church, but I'm not going to say a word about it because it might upset some people that have deep pockets. Now, Gwenoon Diop gave that talk that was in the spring of this year. About a month after he did, a month or two, on May the 18th, Lighthouse Seventh-day Adventist Church, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, announced that Gwenoon Diop's scheduled appearance had been canceled due to an emergency hospital internment. Now here was the ad right there. He was going to speak in Fort Lauderdale. It was canceled. And the reason why he had had cardiac arrest was being treated for his condition at John Hopkins Hospital in Maryland. Folk, as I think it was Logan last night said, you know, th this would call into question um, I don't know if it was stress related. I don't know if it was diet related. Um, but friends, that's serious. Cardiac arrest? Almost died? I don't know. I don't know. Did Gwenoon Diop get the message? Has he stopped? He hasn't, folk. Three weeks ago, Gwenoon Diop was over in Kenya. 
Gwinnun Diop stated in a panel discussion. He said the Catholic Church has changed since 1965. The Catholic Church now today believes in religious liberty. Anyone who now believes that the papacy is the same as during the Dark Ages is a slanderer. Now, folk, maybe some of you are sitting there and you're saying, you know, Bill, Bill Hughes, he's, he's just making these stories up. He, he, he's just got a vendetta against the church, and he doesn't like Gwinnun Diop, and he's just making it up. Folk, go back. Go back to your computer. Type into Google search Gwinnun Diop panel discussion Kenya 914.24, three weeks ago. Type it in for yourself. Listen to him tell you this. He says these very things. That's where I got it. He said the Catholic Church has changed. The Catholic Church now believes in religious liberty, and if anybody says that the papacy is the same as during the Dark Ages, they're a slanderer. That's what he said. The Catholic document that Gwinnun Diop mentioned on religious liberty that was done in 1965 was called uh, Digitatus Humanae, or Declaration on Religious Liberty, which was promulgated by Pope Paul VI, December 7, 1965. Based on this document, Gwinnun Diop said that anyone who still speaks against Rome is a slanderer. Can you mention the third angel's message? If you do, you are now a what? You're a slanderer. If you quote from the great controversy, you are now a slanderer. Well, what does Ellen White say about does Rome change? Do they change? Do they not change? Great Controversy, page 571. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. So Gwinnun Diop says that the papacy has changed. And Ellen White says they haven't changed. So who are we going to follow? Ellen White. God's words. God's words. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. The papacy is just what prophecy declared she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, 
She conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics nor persons suspected of heresy. She declares, shall this power whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints be now acknowledged as a part of the church of Christ? And so here we are as Seventh-day Adventists today. The spirit of prophecy says one thing, Rome hasn't changed. But a, a leader among Seventh-day Adventists, whom Ted Wilson says is a man of God, is telling us Rome has. So which voice, folk, are we going to accept? Well, we're going to accept God's voice, hopefully, the one through the spirit of prophecy, because the denomination will tell you, well, anybody that's still in the ship, where are they going? They're going on to heaven, aren't they? So based on the false idea that the denomination has today, Gwenun Diop's heading straight for the kingdom. You see the deception, folk? Well, Ellen White says that Rome hasn't changed. And Gwenun Diop says they have changed. Let's see if they have since 1965. Let's see. 1998, the Pope at that time, his name was John Paul II. John Paul II wrote a encyclical called Dies Domini, which translated meant the sacredness of Sunday. Now in that document, John Paul II made three calls Number one, he called for Roman Catholics to keep Sunday holy and to come to Mass. Number two, he called for secular governments throughout the world to enact Sunday laws, forbidding all work on Sunday. And number three, he called for secular governments to enforce these laws. It would be assumed that this would include the imposition of penalties for how else could the laws be enforced. And the question I asked down here, does that sound like religious liberty to you? It's not religious liberty at all, is it? There's strike one. Back in the middle of the 1970s, about 10 years after Pope Paul VI wrote his encyclical, in Argentina, there was a conflict called Argentina's Dirty War. And the war was raged between the military dictatorship and its left-wing opponents during which time the state murdered over 10,000 people. Now friends, Argentina is a Ro Roman Catholic country. And at the time of the Dirty War, Pope Francis was the superior general of the Society of Jesus in Argentina. Wow. So he was the highest cleric in all of Argentina at that time. Now a lot of people have gone to prison, a lot of high level political and religious leaders in Argentina. The only high ranking official that escaped punishment was Jorge Bergoglio, he didn't go to prison, but all the rest of them did. 
Many people disappeared. This one woman, Estella de la Cuarta, she never again saw her husband, a brother-in-law, and her sister, Elena. Former officials convicted in Argentina's dirty war trial. A court has sentenced 48 people to prison for crimes committed at a notorious torture center run by Argentina's Junta. More than 30,000 people were kidnapped, tortured, and killed in this dirty war from 1976 to 1983. Friends, there was, no war, there was no freedom in Argentina at that time. There was no civil liberty. There was no religious liberty. I don't think Rome's changed. Gwenun Diop says they have. It, history does not tell us that. What about during COVID? What about during COVID? Did anybody lose their liberty at that time? Churches were closed. People couldn't go to work. We were told to quarantine at home. Liberty, civil, religious, and otherwise were all annihilated during COVID-19. Churches were shut down. People couldn't go to work. All liberty was shredded in the name of public safety. Now, who told us that? Who told us we couldn't go to church? Who were the loudest voices? Those were the three loudest voices at that time. Anthony Fauci, Como of New York, Newsom of California. Do you know what they all have in common? They're all Catholics. They were all trained by Jesuits. Anthony Fauci went to Holy Cross, a Jesuit institution in Massachusetts. Andrew Como went to Fordham University in New York. Gavin Newsom went to Santa Clara University, a Jesuit institution in California. All three of these men were trained by the Jesuits. Anthony Fauci was the one who funded the COVID-19 research in Wuhan, China. He funded it, pushed it, and implemented it and then gave the solutions for how to deal with it. All devout Catholics, all trained by the Jesuits to destroy civil and religious liberty. Rome hasn't changed, folks. Rome has not changed. Gwenun Diop, as an infiltrator, a Jesuit, a trained assassin, his goal is to destroy what we believe as a people. What we believe as a people. I'd like to close this talk. We we'll just sing the first stanza. It's time for the soldiers of Christ to arise and to defend the truths we've been given as a people. This man, Ted Wilson, and all their cronies, they're seeking to destroy what Seventh-day Adventists believe. So folk, let's sing together. Soldiers of Christ, arise. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Strong in the Power. 
Time to rise, folk. It's time to rise. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, there's a war, a great controversy that is raging against your truth today. And it's not so much coming from outside, it's coming from within, from time servers, from infiltrators, from those that despise and hate the three angels' messages. But we thank you, Father, that you've given us these truths. We thank you that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, stands behind these messages and they will not be stopped. Regardless of the shenanigans, the insanity, and the foolishness of Gwenun Diop and others, your three angels' messages will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. I just pray, Father, that you would empower each one of us to do whatever we can to see those messages fly to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.